and welcome to the New Leaf Podcast. This is my podcast about knitting and crocheting and my way of documenting my journey to becoming a full-time knitwear and crochet designer. My name is Carmen and you can find me on Instagram as newleafdesigns.nl. I also have a website newleafdesigns.nl where you can find all kinds of uh, free patterns whether it's crochet or knitting or other types of craft. Um, yeah, so I think close to 50 free patterns on there. So have a look around. Um, I will list all of the other things here. And yes, welcome. It's going to be a very exciting episode because I have a lot of fun things to talk about and to show you. Um, as always, thank you very, very much for subscribing to my channel, for liking my videos. It helps me, you know, uh, it helps my videos spread <laughs> to other parts of the world. And um, I appreciate it all very, very much. And um, yes, thank you. So for today, I have two finished objects. I have one giveaway announcement. I have a new, well, we have a knit along that is ending and a crochet along announcement. And then I also have a lot of other fun stuff. And yes, I've been vlogging a little bit and I will put that in this video. So yes, I'm excited, I'm excited. I'm just gonna take a quick sip. Don't worry, I'm not gonna tell you anything about what I'm drinking. It always annoys me when people do that. <laughs> Don't know. Um, it's just usually when I watch other podcasts, I'm, I'm watching for the knitting content. And I don't care what tea you're drinking or where you bought your cup. So maybe an un un unpopular opinion. So um, I won't share any more about that. Um, yes. So my first finished object is already visible on the screen. I'm wearing my Melly cardigan, which um, I just love. I finished it. I properly finished it only a couple of days ago, but before that I have been wearing it with all of the ends still attached and without the buttons sewn on. Um, yes, it's just oh, it's so nice to wear and um, the first cardigan that I knit last year was a 100% wool garment and uh it was one of those rustic yarns uh so i really i wore it in winter time and it was super warm and just really really cozy uh but since this is so this is a hundred percent merino i think maybe there's some night no there's no nylon in here no <laughs> uh so the main uh, yarn that I've been using is by Craftfulness. Uh, Craftfulness is a hand-dyed yarn company owned by Sandra, which is a who is a friend of mine uh, from Friesland, from the northern region of the Netherlands, and she dyes amazing yarns. And this col colorway is called All the Mauves of the World, or All the Mauves in the World, and it's on her uh, spoil base, on her DK spoil base. And I think it's 100% superwash merino. So since it's superwash, um, it's not as warm as regular wool. And um, but it's actually perfect for now because sometimes you just want a little warm layer and not want it to be overheating. Um, and it's also a cropped cardigan and the sleeves are nice and wide so yeah it's uh, the perfect just add-on layering piece for now um, so I have the pom-pom issue that I, uh, that the pattern is in I have it right here it's issue 20 it's from spring 2017 and it's the Melly Cardigan by Camille Rossel. Here it is. I'll show you close up actually. 
So as you can see, it has bat wings and it's kind of cropped and it has a, a deep V neck. And um, uh, I made a few modifications. As you can see here in the original, um, the button bat is the same color as the rest of the cardigan and I chose to do a contrasting button band. Uh, so while in the pattern the button band is knit along with the, um, the body, uh, I knit mine afterwards. And the original pattern has a really, really wide neck uh, opening. <laughs> Um, so really narrow shoulders and uh, I read in some of the project pages on Ravelry which I've grown to really appreciate. I really appreciate other people's notes. So whenever I do uh, uh, project entries in my own uh, Ravelry kind of notebook, uh, I try to be as detailed as possible. Um, so other people were saying that the cardigan kept dropping off of their shoulders and um, yeah, I kind of wanted to prevent that. So I did less decreases so that I would have more fabric left over at the shoulder. And um, yeah, it worked out pretty well. Um, it stays put, so... I'm really happy. The only thing I've had trouble with, uh, which I also talked about on the last episode, was that the button band, um, I was afraid that the button band was going to flip. Uh, and by that, by that I mean that it would curl outwards. And as you can see, it still does that sometimes. So sometimes it won't, lay flat, it will curl over, um, um, and so I haven't fixed it um, perfectly, but um, I find that it only curls when I really pull on it, and then, you know, when I put it back, it just kind of stays put. So what I have done is of course you would not have this problem if you would just knit the button band as it is in a pattern um this is not anything to do with a pattern it's just i wanted to do a contrasting button band because i had uh bought two few skeins of the main color so i had to you know work a different yarn in there somewhere but i do really really like how it has worked up and I do like the contrasting button band. So I probably will do this for future cardigans and even if that means I have to adapt the pattern. So if some of you are willing to do that too, here's some tips of mine. Uh, so first of all, when you knit the pattern, of course you have to take off the, the button band stitches because otherwise you'll, your cardigan will be too wide. Okay, so you'll have to make a few um, calculations and um, for example, I think I took off five or six stitches uh, in order to uh, make up for the button band so I could add that uh, with back on later. And afterwards, I picked up stitches along the side and I picked up three stitches for every four stitches. That's, you can, all, you can also pick up two stitches for every three stitches. So by that I mean that if, if there are um, four stitches on the main body, for that portion, you pick up only three stitches of that, and then you just skip one. And that's um, 
that would keep the button band from being like wavy and flaring out and having too many stitches. So that's a kind of a formula that I found online. I think it was by Coco Knits. The, uh, who said that it was three stitches per four stitches and uh, then I did a knit row first well you can look at it as a purl row or a knit row I did a row that um, on the right side of the fabric looks like a purl row but uh, I picked up all the stitches and then I started knitting from this side and uh, from the wrong side. So I just did one knit row so that it would appear as a purl row on the front. And having a purl row in there on the right side helps, helps to keep the uh, ribbing or button band or whatever kind of uh, cuff or ribbing you're doing, it helps it from from curling or, or flipping. Uh, I've also done that for the cuff on the sleeves and for the hem on the bottom. I also did a little pearl row. Um, and the button band is, is knit on smaller needles, just like the hem or uh, ribbing or cuff. Um, so keep that in mind. Smaller needle, pearl row, three out of four stitches picked up, so 75%. Okay, and then I knit in one by one rib and I made some buttonholes doing a yarn over and knit two together. Uh, but what I actually want to get to is how I bound off because that was the um, most important thing. So I usually choose between two types of, all, two types of binding off either it's a regular bind off or it's a stretchy bind off and by regular bind off i mean you knit two stitches and you lift the first one over the second that's a non-stretchy bind off by a stretchy bind off i mean that you knit two stitches and then you knit those stitches together through the back loop so by knitting stitches together you add some extra meterage in there, uh, some extra yarn, which makes it stretchy. Because, I don't know, I don't know why, I thought the button band should not be as stretchy. So I did the non-stretchy bind off for the entire button band. So the, the non-stretchy where you just slip the first stitch over their second. Um, and repeat that. But it didn't really work. I only noticed that after I finished the whole thing uh, and I even had snipped the yarn. So when I had done that, um, the button band was like pointing upwards. It was like this, uh, just because it was too tight. So I thought, okay, well, I will uh, do just Oh, I did another bind off. So, okay, usually I I choose between three kinds of binding off. So, um, there's another one that's kind of like in between. It's not super stretchy, but it's also not very rigid. So, um, if you have a ribbing, of course you have knit and purl stitches. And if you knit all of them and bind off that way, the cast off edge will be very straight. There will be no type of waving. It will be very, just very clean. Uh, you can also knit the knits and purl the purls and then do the slipped stitches. I use that for uh, some type, sometimes sock cuffs. It's just a little bit more stretchy so I did that. I picked out the cast off edge all the way and I started um, the knit the knits, purl the pearls, but then slip the first stitch over the second 
kind of. Um, and I did that the whole way through, uh, but still it was too tight. Uh, so I decided to do the super stretchy bind off, which was uh, the knitting two together or purling two together. But I only did that on the neck portion. So, so this part, which is, you know, the straight, I did that, knitting the knits, purling the pearls, it's still slipping the first stitch over the second. <laughs> it's a really long-winded explanation. But, and from here, where the button band kind of, kind of curves, from here all the way across the back of the neck and to the next curve, I did the super stretchy bind off with, um, with knitting two stitches together to create extra stretch. And then here I did the um, regular bind off again that I also did on this side. And that seems to have done the trick. <laughs> uh, I feel so silly for talking about bind off for such a long time, but it really made a huge difference. And uh, also after that, I, uh, I wet blocked the cardigan again and I steam blocked the button band which also helps to relax the yarn the fiber so that it would stay less flat have less tension um, it still sometimes curls as I've said but I don't know if it's really the button band um, well maybe I could have fixed it by either well it's it has something to do here in this area where uh where the neck decreases start so i'm not sure whether it's the main body that i should have done decreases less often or increase uh, yes decreases less often so that is a uh, more gradual slope or that I would have that I should have picked up more stitches here I'm not sure um, what would be the best solution uh, because I do feel that this is the problem area because it flips right there uh, so but I feel like I got a, a bit a bit further to a non curling button band <laughs> I'm still not completely there but I don't know I will fix that on the next one. Um, the other thing I could have done differently is I placed one button like super high. I would never really close that one, I think. But anyway, uh, I don't often close cardigan. So, so yeah, the buttons are more of a decorative feature. Uh, but I do like them very much. I got them at Liberty in London and they all have different fabrics. I have the gray and mauve and some some uh, sea green and some uh, pink details. Oh, and some yellow too. I really like them though and they they fit or they match really well with the cardigan so yes yes I really like that and um, I really like this cardigan um, I recommend this pattern to anyone um, but I would say that the, the sewing of the different parts was a little uh, challenging just because the pattern didn't have any real instructions on that it just says sew this to this and then yeah <laughs> so that's um, it kind of assumes that you know that um, yeah so I used a, a pearl side mattress stitch for the um, sleeves and I 
I uh, did not use a mattress stitch for this. I just pinned the sleeve to the body and I turned them inside out and then I uh, sewed them together. I uh, explained a little bit more about that on the last episode. Um, yes, but other than that, it was a really, really enjoyable pattern. Um, I love the pearl side, that the pearl side is the right side. Um, Yes, and um, I love the shape too, uh, even though, you know, it has really wide uh, sleeves. I, I still think it's a flattering shape and it's kind of cropped, which it makes it perfect for high-waisted skirts, which I wear really often. Uh, yes, so that's my Melly cardigan. The second finished object has to do with the knit along that has just ended. Uh, my striped and stranded knit along, uh, which is a knit along for my striped and stranded socks. These were the original striped and stranded socks. And up until May 9th, which was yesterday, you could post. Uh, FO pictures in the FO thread on the Ravelry in the Ravelry group. Um, I closed the thread just uh, just an hour ago, uh, just so that the last minute uh, some last minute people could still get their pictures in there. I'm looking at you, Kyla. <laughs> and um, yes, I, it was so much fun to host this this knit along and I am so so pleased looking at all of your gorgeous finished objects and um, that you were sharing them in the Ravelry group and uh, talking about them um, with each other and sharing pictures on Instagram and yes it was just so much fun and um, I just really loved seeing all of the different color combinations. People are being so creative. Um, yes, and I, I can't wait for more projects for this uh, pattern. Uh, I will announce the giveaway winner for this knit along in just a moment. I have the prize right here, which is a skein of fat funky fibers and the contrast colors to make this exact pair. But before that, I will show you my second pair of striped and stranded socks, which I have just finished, well, minus the ends, uh, just before I hit record. And <laughs> so the ends are still attached. Lo and behold, these are my second pair of striped and stranded socks. <laughs> I've not washed them yet. They're just on the blocker so they look a little bit more presentable. Um, I didn't finish them in time for the knit along. I was, I think, halfway done with the ribbing when I closed the thread. But um, yeah, I. I couldn't enter my own knit along uh, anyway, so, but I'm so happy that they're finished and I'm so, so happy with the colors and uh, I believe, well, I know last time uh, on the podcast I was at this little kitty marker and um, so I had finished up until here of the first sock and then so in the past two weeks I have finished the first sock and I have finished the entire second sock um, and in order to make the second sock uh, a lot quicker I did the same color work patterning all over so you can see here, I use the same color work charts here. Here I, um, I did one extra row on the bottom here. I didn't notice that I had just done one row there, but anyway. Um, and this matches, this matches, these match, and then 
So it, it still looks different because the background colors are not the same. So what, what of course, what I like most about these socks is the mix, mixing and matching of um, color work patterns. I love that. Um, but it also, it takes a bit of time to figure out, okay, which, uh, which pattern am I going to knit next? Um, and I want to make sure that I haven't just knit that pattern, just a few stripes below. So uh, in order to speed up the second sock, I just followed the color work patterns from the first one. Um, it's bound to be a little bit different and even, uh, even more so because the background color uh, was different. So they are not twins, but still sisters. <laughs> um, and I just, I just really, really love these socks. And I have a whole bunch of this yarn left over. So let me show you the yarn. This is the self-striping yarn that I use. This is West Yorkshire Spinners. Um, they have a whole line of self-striping yarn, which is amazing. And they're all called by uh, cocktail names. So this one is the Passion Fruit Cooler colorway. And I love passion fruit and I love these colors. It's just green and purple and yellow is just totally my thing right now. Kind of also matches my cardigan. <laughs> I actually just weighed this ball and I still have about 68 grams left. So, you know, it was 100 grams. So I used 32 grams. So I could make two more pairs with this game. Go figure. And for the contrast color, um, I, I use two contrast colors for this. One is the color work and one is the um, toes, heels and cuffs. And uh, from that I have a lot left. And then for the contrast color way for the uh, color work, I have, well, I still have a little bit of this left and I just wound a little bit of an entire skein so I still have a bunch. Um, so yes, the striped and stranded socks are a very economical uh, pair of socks to knit. Well, usually stripy yarn is a little bit more expensive than uh, regular sock yarn but uh, this was I think about eight euros or eight pounds about it from from a shop in England yeah I think it was eight pounds per ball uh, but still it's not as bad or as bad um, I mean it's not as you know expensive as indie dye yarns some uh, indie dyed uh, striped yarns go for like 28 euros so I understand if that's out of your budget I totally understand so that's why I wanted to make some uh, commercial uh, um, commercially dyed no I wanted to make socks with commercially dyed yarn yes um, yeah, and I really love how they turned out. I love this colorway and I love that the stripes are much narrower than on my first pair. And you can see with this one, I really, um, I was able to find um, color work patterns that can really be framed in one stripe. So it doesn't um the color work there doesn't overlap from one stripe to the other and here it does but still it still looks like i chose a different um color work pattern for each stripe it's just you know if you want to look really close at my socks you'll see that the color work spreads across multiple stripes sometimes, but no one's gonna look that close at 
that closely at your socks. <laughs> um, but still, I liked uh, knitting uh, two different socks from the same uh, pattern. And um, yeah, so as always, you can find my pattern for these socks in my Ravelry store, which where it is called the Striped and Stranded Socks, and also on my own website, newleaf newleafdesigns.nl. And uh, it's uh, for purchase in the shop there and there are multiple um, paying options because on Ravelry you, you can only use PayPal I think and on my own website I have loads more so anyway time for the giveaway announcement and so just a quick recap or I think I already did that right so um, the prize is a wonderful skein of fat fungi fibers which is the same colorway as I used for my first pair see it's almost unrecognizable but it really is the same colorway it's called splash of sunshine by fat funky fibers I was really very generously donated by Elaine from fat funky fibers who hand dyes this yarn um, it is 75% merino, 25% nylon. It's a fingering weight. And I will also get you new skeins of these contrast colors that I use. I just haven't been able to <laughs> buy them yet, but I will get those in time and ship them out to the winner. And now it is time to announce the giveaway winner. And let me just say, so I think there were, we had 13 posts, but then the first post was mine. So we had 12 finished uh, pairs in the uh, finished object spread and one knitter even submitted two pairs and um, they were all amazing. And I'm going to put in pictures of every pair right here. Aren't they all amazing? I love how different they all are and just they all have a different personality. <laughs> so without further ado, the giveaway winner was post number 13, the very last entry, which was Knockout Kyla, aka Kyla from Art Post Myths Podcast. Congratulations, Kyla! You won the yarn pack for the original pair of striped and stranded socks. Yay! If you would send me a Ravelry message with your um, address, then I will get your price shipped out to you. Yay! <laughs> Thank you all very, very much for entering my knit along, and I look forward to hosting many, many more cows. So, knit alongs and crochet alongs. So, talking about crochet alongs, I am planning to do a crochet along for my. Uh, I should get my shawl out here. I'm so. I'm so unprepared. <laughs> Let me get my shawl. <laughs> okay, I've kind of already spoiled the surprise by saying it. It's a, it's a shawl. <laughs> but I have this really nice summer crochet pattern, which is the Breeze Blocks shawl. It's a huge shawl. Well, by current standards, maybe not as huge um, because you can kind of 
wrap it around once. You can just loosely drape it over your shoulder and it's a really nice accessory for one of those summer evenings that you want to stay out a little bit longer because the light is still, you know, it's still light outside, but it gets a little bit chilly. That's where this wrap is perfect. And you can see that it's a gradient. So it transitions from white to light gray to light blue to darker and darker and darker and darker blue. And I made this shawl with one cake of Scapius Whirl, which is a gradient yarn. This is not the same colorway, but it's a gradient yarn. This one has a bit starker contrast. Um, you only need one cake of yarn for this entire shawl. And I am thinking of hosting a crochet along with this. Still have to think about when to when, kind of, because I will be on holiday in June, but I will have all of the details ready in my next podcast episode, so stay tuned. Whew, okay, now we have the finished objects part ready and the, the long giveaway and the crochet along kind of announcement, pre-announcement. Now I'm going to show you my sock knitting whip. And in the last episode, I showed you my first sock that I knit from a sock blank. And the sock blank was Alice in Wonderland themed. I still have a little bit left. It's unraveling on the other side as well. This is the Mad Hatcher and um, there is a little piece of Alice left. It sounds really... Um, <laughs> That's like a horror story. There's a little piece left. Um, and this is the second sock. <laughs> I have my cute little goldfish in a bag progress keeper on here. And um, I, I moved this project process pro progress keeper every day. So this is what I did at my last lunch break. Um, I did a garter stitch, a garter stitch short row heel, and yeah, pretty vanilla otherwise. Um, and when it's done, I will turn it inside out because I want to use the pearl side as the right side, because I think it looks cool. And um, so <laughs> you can see Alice's hair here, Alice's hair color, and her dress here on the back side, and yeah, I'm halfway done with the leg. Yeah, so still a little bit left to do. I think I won't finish the sock blank, but I can save it for scrappy socks. Um, yeah, I don't have much else to say about this. Um, I think I talked about this at length for in the last episode, so hopefully I'll have a finished pair to show you. But progress is very slow on this one because I usually only knit at it uh, during my lunch, lunch breaks at work. And uh, I do have to eat in those lunch breaks, so I usually have about 10 minutes per day um, to knit on that. Another very exciting thing that I have to show you is the new issue of Scapius Yarn, which is a bookazine that uh, is published twice every year and they have um, a spring-summer issue and a autumn-winter win issue. This is the spring and summer issue for this year and the theme is woman. It's a celebration of all women from all cultures, all ages, all walks of life. And um, I love each and every pro project in this. I also contributed a design to this issue, which is the tablecloth you see here and also here. 
and I also wrote a blog post about this so if you want to learn more about this and see beautiful pictures then go to my blog and I think it's still the latest blog entry so it'll be easy to find. So I designed a crochet heirloom tablecloth for this issue and I love the photography. The girl is so cute. And each time I look at it, I want that pie. I want it. <laughs> so I kind of designed this with family dinners in mind and that this would be an heirloom piece that could be passed on from mother, mother to daughter or mother to solder, you know. Um, and you know just big family dinners summer evenings uh very large italian style tables and then just uh have this tablecloth draped over the table with lots of dishes and food and it was very very enjoyable to crochet as well I don't have the sample here to show you since it's at um, at Capius HQ, uh, but you can see the motive up close here, and it's a join as you go pattern, and it's made up of I think 48 squares, and then there's an edging uh, that's um, crocheted afterwards. Yes, and I really loved uh, crocheting this. It uses about 20 balls of 100% uh, cotton yarn, uh, Scapius Katona, and it's just really sturdy and it will hold up and uh, you can throw it in the washing machine. Really, really nice. Um, and let me show you some of the other patterns. I, I just love this model. Oh, she is so... She, she just looks like such a strong woman and um i love that in the um in the beginning of the book uh it says something about each model and um so there's a yoga cushion in here the beautiful design from esther happy and red and a beautiful dress and that's used with that's made with Scapius Whirl so a beautiful gradient and this is by Tatiana from Lilla Bjorn Crochet and what do we have the little sister and big sister shawls by Susan Carlson from Felted Button and by Tammy Canavan from um, Canadutch and here we all are <laughs> see there's me um and in this issue they um they interviewed us about our colors um because we have our own colorways for the Scapius R Tribe yarn and we had to explain okay what's your uh, inspiration for these colorways and uh, who is your female role model and yeah and this one I love this one super edgy super cool uh, this one uh, it's the Rebel Wrap by Kissen from Hack Marak and um, just a lot of beautiful patterns in here. Wow. So beautiful. Yeah. Yes, so get your copy of this bookazine because it's amazing. And I know I say that about every issue, but uh, I just love having this collection and um, so it's both crochet and knitting patterns mostly crochet and uh, so it's like the crochet version of pom-pom basically 
because Pom Pom Quarterly has mostly knitting patterns and then some sewing and crochet patterns thrown in. But because the Netherlands is really crochet heavy, uh, there are a lot of people who rather crochet than knit. Um, yeah, so crochet patterns are really popular here. Yeah, scent. It's just a really, really beautiful issue and um, yes, go get it. <laughs> okay, so I have two more things to talk about today. And this is already going to be a long episode, I think. So <laughs> I'll just mention this one really quickly as I haven't done much on this. I have cast on for the No Frills sweater. Um, yeah, so I'm going to be knitting a mohair sweater in summer, but hopefully it will be done by autumn. Uh, so the No Frills sweater is a immensely popular Lump Raglan sweater which uses a fingering weight yarn held together with a mohair lace weight, lace weight yarn. And the yarns I have chosen is Debbie Bliss uh, a Tweed um, Debbie Bliss uh, and it's wool and cashmere and it's beautiful. It, it's kind of in a denim color way. Um, I got this from a shop in Antwerp or Antwerp um, online, Yulia's shop. And the mohair I'm using is a hand dyed mohair as by Stranded Dye Works by Amy from the Stranded Dye Works podcast. Uh, or stranded podcast and this is her meddlesome colorway don't know what it means I have the feeling that it means something um, and it's on her drift mohair base and it's beautiful just beautiful I'm just using I'm not alternating skeins yet just because I'm just at the beginning and um, I think because I don't want to alternate well, I don't want to have four balls of yarn attached to, to my sweater. So I think that when I get close to separating for the sleeves, I will do a little bit of striping or alternating, I mean. So yeah, because I don't want to do it all the way through. Um, I'm really loving it so far. I had some trouble with swatching, but that was because I was swatching flat, so working in rows and not in rounds because this is a sweater that's knit in the round. So I, and I didn't reach gauge with the needle, but when I did a gauge swatch in the round with that very same needle, I got gauge. So yeah, so make sure that if you're doing a circular sweater or a sweater that's knitted in the round to also knit the gauge swatch in the round and I just I just knit a tube and just measured from that and um, I actually I unraveled the swatch already so I can't show you so I uh, cast on I don't know 50 stitches or so it of course it depends because you want to be able to measure 10 centimeters flat on one side. So the whole swatch has to be like uh, 25 to 30 centimeters if you would, you know, snip it. Um, so, and I used a smaller needle size in the, in the same tube and then I did one purl row so I would know where I switched to a different needle size and I would um, use another needle size for that. So you don't need to make separate swatches for each needle size. If you feel like you need to um, try out multiple sizes. So that's what I did. And uh, I chose a four millimeter needle just to give it a little bit more air between the stitches. Uh, three and a half millimeter just felt a little bit too cramped. And having some air between the stitches, you know, because air is warmth. So um, if your stitches are 
a little bit space apart especially with mohair it will just hold down to like tiny pockets of air and it will really keep you insulated so um, yes I think this will be a very warm sweater so let me just show the colors up close to you because they are so pretty and there are so many colors because the fingering weight yarn I am using is multicolored with this tweed flex and of course the mohair is hand dyed and it just leaves so many beautiful colors it's it's amazing how much a mohair can add to you know how much color a mohair can add to a project all right so my camera keeps overheating and i have to stop <laughs> uh, so i'm gonna just uh, go quickly through this last part uh, I'm gonna put in some vlogs now uh, that I shot over the last weekend and uh, it's about naturally dyeing yarn. So here we go. Hi. So for this podcast episode, I'm doing something different or at least an additional little bit. Um, so I just received some exciting yarns and they are undyed yarns and I've bought them so I can experiment a little bit more with hand dyeing because I've just, um, yeah, all my, <laughs> all my yarn that used to be white has already been dyed except for this yarn that I bought last year and I just don't know what color to dye it in because it has silver sparkle and yeah actually because of the natural dye I can only really dye yellow orange pink and yeah and kind of like brown and I didn't really think that fit with the silver selena I just I kind of want a blue for this so yeah, so I'm saving that. So I had the need for some undyed yarn that I could practice on and it has arrived. Eee! <laughs> so here's what I have received. This entire box was filled with yarn. Uh, I took this out and I also have some dye ingredients. So there's a whole bag of chamomile flowers. There is a small bag of cochineal, which is actually dried beetles, um, but they produce a lovely pink color. And uh, birch leaves, a whole bag of that. Um, this yarn is merino, 100% merino. Uh, it's a little sport weight, I think. Um, and then here I have some lanolin yarn, and you really feel... Kind of the lanolin grease in here um, and some sock yarn which has rami instead of nylon so uh, and also 20% silk so it is still really strong and here's my little dyeing prep station <laughs> I have the alum right here and here I packed some of the chamomile flowers and I have some madder root in here so that's a madder root as I bought it I, for, um, I still have to grind them to a fine powder in order for me to use it but I keep the rest in here and then I have my little scale of course and some cups so I have some yarn um, dying in the pot right now and I have some drying outside and I'm just about to prepare another dye bath so I'm gonna take you along with me so the matter needed to be soaked in water well first uh, grind it to a powder so I did that in my mortar anyway the thing you use for Asian cooking um, and then soaked in water overnight but I did that this 
this morning so I just let it sit for eight hours it looks like well yum right now uh, but yes so <laughs> it looks kind of weird now, but I'm gonna put it in the dye pot. I have one aluminum pot, one stainless steel pot. I'm still not quite sure what, um, what effect that might have, but I'm gonna use the aluminum pot for this one. Um, yeah, so let's see what happens. So I've added the matter into the dye pot with some more added water and I'm just gonna let that simmer for an hour to extract the dye and here I have some merino um, in a chamomile dye bath and this is actually the second skein that I've put in this dye bath so it will be less vibrant than the first. So it's about 45 minutes later and I have strained the matter root out of the dye pot. The dye that I extracted from that is in here. So it's looking really deep wine red. And this is the matter root, um, the dye material that you know, I took out of the pot and I think I might try and get a second dye bath from this. So here I have the pot. I already filled it with some extra water and now I am going to transfer the dye in there. Ooh, steady, steady. It's such a rich color um, and I hope I have enough dye for at least two, two skeins. So the yarns that I'm going to use in this uh, matter dye pod, uh, one is a skein of the lanolin yarn which is a DK wool um, and it's you know, the lanolin isn't completely uh, washed out, so it still has that um, greasy feel to it. Um, that sounds gross, but I will explain more about that on the podcast. Uh, and this is the um, wool silk rami blend that is perfect for socks. And both of these were dyed previously uh, yesterday in a avocado bath, but it was not successful. So um, I decided to over dye them. So I'm inserting these into the matter dye pod. The dye is room temperature now, um, which is important because with the natural dyeing you first have to prepare the dye material so by by boiling it for a half an hour to an hour so it will be hot um, and it's important that the yarn doesn't um, change in temperature too fast so so I added some cold water so that it's more like room temperature and over in this dye bath I have the second dye bath of the uh, chamomile and yeah it's still a bit warmer than room temperature I've um, I've turned off the heat uh, about 45 minutes ago when I um, started the matter root um, and the idea is that you let it cool down by itself so to not um, felt the yarn by changing temperature but I might be able to take it out so I'm going to transfer it into this right here And 
and I will just add some more water to cool it down a bit more quickly and then take it out so I can let it dry good morning it's the next day now and um, I believe what I recorded last was um, the matter root bubbling in the pot um, anyway the results of my dye experiments yesterday are drying outside right in front of me so I will show you they're out in the Sun so I don't know if now the color doesn't really take um, but I'll show you in a bit in the podcast because the colors are amazing um, the matter uh, is a really nice coral red and the chamomile two nice shades of yellow I think I showed you that in the previous video um, anyway so I have the first and second dye bath of the chamomile the second was much lighter and I had the first dye bath of matter which is a really lovely like strawberry coral pinky red now um, I have so I took out the yarn from the first dye bath and then there was still color left in the dye pot so um, the the water was you know still colored uh, and from that I got this so I put in another skein of yarn now the lights all all yellow in my kitchen but um, again I'll show you in a bit more properly but it is a really lovely light peachy salmony um, pink so that's really nice and the matter root that I got out had enough dye in it for a second dye bath so um, this is a whole new pot and I uh, cooked the matter root again and <laughs> again the lights all yellow here so it's showing up orange on my screen but it is really a beautiful shade of red so all of this is really exciting and in the uh, dye pot that I first cooked the matter in there is still a little bit of color left so what I might do is um, is do a little combination of the two so uh, I watched this video on that uh, you put a skein into the dye pot while it's still in a skein so in a twisty twisty skein um, so that in some parts it's still white it doesn't take the color all the way through and then so you have a variegated yarn and then when you take it out um, you pull it open again and you twist it again and put it in another dye pot then you can have a three color skein so I think I'm gonna try that but it will be a very subtle variegated because they are both matter root but yeah we'll see I'm just experimenting and I'm having a lot of fun So I just wanted to show you the progress on this one because this is the experiment I was talking about. I twisted the skein, put it in a dye bath with very light um, matter dye in it. So I don't know if you can see. I've already taken it out and it was all this uh, light salmony pink shade on the outside then I opened the skein and I retwisted it again so now you can see some of the white parts on the outside and in a while I'm preparing another matter dye bath right now um, this is actually still from the very same matter root I have it's just produced another dye bath so I think I should use much less of matter root um, because I used even less than was uh, said in the recipe and it just it gave me well three dye baths already 
Um, so I'm gonna throw this one in there when the dye is finished. Uh, so I hope there will be parts with white, parts uh, peach, and then parts that will be a darker red tone. So we'll see. So as you were able to see, I have bought some undyed yarns from a wool mill spinnery, spinnery, not mill, from a wool spinnery in uh, Germany. And I have bought three types of wool from them. Uh, one type is merino. That's this one. It's a 100% merino. I haven't checked yet if it's superwash or non-superwash. I'll have to ask them. Um, and it's just a little bit thicker than a fingering weight. So I will, I would say this is a sport weight. It's about 300 meters per 100 grams. And it's, uh, it's just beautifully plump. And I have got a sock yarn. So a fingering weight yarn. It's uh, light fingering actually. And uh, this is 60% merino, 20% silk, and 20% rami, which is a plant fiber. I think it's made from the bark of um, trees, tree bark, I think, but um, I'm not, quite sure. I just know that it's really strong fiber and that's why it's used in sock yarn. So really excited about this one. Um, and then lastly I have lanolin yarn which is a DK weight yarn and uh, also I don't know if... No, I think it's 100% wool so I don't think it's merino. I'm not quite sure actually. Uh, I think I've written it down here. It's 100% wool and it's 220 meters per 100 grams. So that makes it a DK weight and it's a two ply. See? Um. Yes, and I hope this will be good for uh, like color work mittens, uh, color work hats, or not even color work, but I just thought this was a really great mitten and hat yarn. And the lanolin, it's called yet lanolin yarn. There is still a lanolin in here. And after dyeing, I don't feel it as much because I think it has um, cooked out. Um, it, you know, you can rinse it out. Um, but if it's still in there while you're knitting with it, it really smoothens, soft, softens your hands. It's really smooth to the touch and a little bit greasy. I believe I told that in the vlogs. When I say greasy, it sounds a bit gross. And it, you know, to my boyfriend doesn't like touching this, but he is not a fan of like lip balm or hand lotion, or he just like, Ugh. Um, he, <laughs> he doesn't want to uh, touch my hands if I got hand lotion on them. So he was touching this wool and he was like, oh, it's like there's lotion all over it. but. That's kind of how it feels, but uh, if you then knit with it, it's amazing for your hands. But of course, I I don't know uh, how much is left of that after dyeing because I do rinse it a couple of times uh, and also heat it, with, which, you know, adding heat to lanolin wool makes the lanolin kind of you know, detach itself from the wool. So let me show you the yarns that I have dyed. So I have dyed a couple of each, um, of each yarn base. Um, and what I did first was chamomile and you have seen the process of this. And I added I think 35 grams 
of chamomile flowers, 30 or 35 grams of chamomile flowers uh, in the dye bath. And as I don't know if I said this in the vlog, but the recipe actually suggested that I use two to one ratio of chamomile flour. So that would be 200 grams of flowers per 100 grams of wool. Yes. So let me show you what 30 grams to 100 grams is. That's this color. It's super bright. So, you know, it's already very saturated. And afterwards, there was enough left for a second dye bath of a very light yellow and after that there even was some more dye left in the pot so i don't really trust these recipes that i found and i aim to just make up my own so 30 grams of chamomile flowers were enough to produce this bright of a color and even have some more dye left produce this color and um, yes I've all also I've already started naming them in my head so like if I would ever sell this color away because I'm still in the testing phase but do you remember you know I'm a huge Harry Potter geek so do you remember that in the Philosopher's Stone when they first go on the Hogwarts Express Ron's like oh do you want to see the spell that turns my rat yellow and he goes like sunshine daisies bur butter mellow so that's the name of this colorway <laughs> sunshine daisies butter mellow yeah and uh, I haven't uh, thought of a name for this one yet but yeah so I really really like uh, these results this is on the merino base this is on the sock base with silk and rami um, yeah I really like those and then I dyed with matter matter is a type of root and I also showed you up close in the video how the root looks like and uh, so I get it in little chunks and um, it's not super expensive, but more expensive than chamomile um, flowers. You get it in chunks and I um, grind them into a powder, uh, which you then uh, can use to, you know, you soak it for at least eight hours and then you can use it to dye. The first two skeins I dyed. Oh yeah, so let me tell you again about the recipes because uh, the recipe said to use hundred to use a one to one ratio. So to use a hundred grams of matter for a hundred grams of wool. But you know since uh, I only had one kilo of matter root, that would mean I could only dye 10 skeins with it. So it's like, nah, I'm not gonna do that. Uh, I'm going for a lighter shade and uh, I've dyed with matter before. I love the shades. I also love it when it's a little bit paler. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna go with 30 grams again. And um, as it turned out, it was more than enough. The first two skeins that I dyed are these two. This is again the sock base, uh, the merino, silk, and rami. And so the ratio I did was 30 grams to um, 200 grams of wool. So that's 15 grams per 100 grams. But still, I had a lot left. I had. So this is the, the first time I, uh, I cooked a dye bath from the matter. And I put these two in. And this is the lanolin wool. It's so super plump. I love it. And I think it would look amazing if I would just use this one and the natural uh, colored one for a hat or for a mitten project. I love this color. And... I love coral and uh, yeah 
So this is the first dye bath. Then, because in the vlog I showed you that I saved the matter that I, um, that I used to produce the first dye bath. And I uh, just put it in a dye pot with water again and cooked it again. Well, not cooked. I, when I say cook, I mean until 80 degrees Celsius. Um, and then, so I could produce another dye bath from, um, from the same matter and I used some merino and this is a beautiful salmon pink colored yarn. There are some, you know, it's, it's tonal. Uh, sometimes the yarn uh, is a little bit white in places, it's a little bit white there because of the string that was attached to it, uh, but oh, it's so beautiful, I really love this color. And, um, and then I did another one, so yes, I think from this matter uh, there was still some color left in the dye pot because you see that when you put in a skein uh, and then after cooking, when you take it out, the water is much lighter because the yarn has taken up that dye powder, that dye stuff. And, uh, but there was still more left. So I, uh, I dyed this beautiful uh, shade of light peachy, peachy pink with it. This is on the uh, Rami Silk Merino base. And then uh, the last one I showed in the vlog was the one that I put into the dye bath while still being in a skein. So I did that, I took it out, and at that point uh, it was like this color, but with blotches of natural so it was with blotches of um, white then I twisted it again uh, in a different place so blotches of white would be on the outside and then I put it in the dye pot again I think when I put it in the dye pot again that I had uh, cooked the matter a third time to get some more color out of it and that results in, so there are three colors in this. So there is still some white left, there is some light peachy pink, and there is some slightly darker peachy pink, which uh, resulted from the two matter dye baths that I gave it. And it's a beautiful kind of heavily tonal how do you say this it's it's not a solid it's it's a soft variegated yarn i love it love it so much and uh right now i have a uh, nettle uh cooking in the dye pot i'm documenting all of this on my instagram stories and i plan to make more vlogs uh, of hand dyeing as well and um, the color that comes from the nettle is um, very, very light grayish green. It's almost just light gray with a green tone to it. But I made the mistake of cooking the nettles whole. Uh, I, I'm, uh, I saw in a recipe that I'm supposed to only dye the uh, leaves and not the stems because um, it can change the color so anyway I will be showing that next time but for now I have these beautiful yarns eee! oh I love them so much I already had a couple of people ask me if I am about to sell these yarns. Um, I think I will eventually because 
I won't be able to use all of those yarns. I do want to use a couple of them. I will keep a couple of them and I will put a couple of them up for sale for a very reduced prices because it's not perfect by far. They are my test skeins. They are my experiments and um, yeah, some of them may be tangled and I just know, I just, I cannot guarantee the quality of the skein and um, of the light fastness of the dye. I mean, I think um, natural dyes won't be as light fast as acid dyes. So even though I let these dry out, I let these dry outside in the sun, so and the color hasn't faded since, but I cannot promise that. So um, yes, I will probably get them up in the shop sometime. Uh, so keep an eye out on my Etsy shop, which is New Leaf Designs NL on Etsy. I do have my knitting and crochet patterns on there and my bird DIY crochet kits. So, um, Keep an eye out but I will I will notify you when I do put some yarns up for sale but for now I'm just having loads of fun I'm experimenting and um, it's just been so great so yeah and I'm running out of memory on my card so <laughs> I really have to wrap up um, yes I hope you enjoyed this episode. <laughs> it had so many projects in it and uh, again, I won't be offended if you watched it in small, uh, small chunks. Uh, yeah, so anyway, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you again next time. Have a very crafty couple of weeks. Bye-bye.